All right, Josh, how's it going? You there? I'm good, man. I'm down. I'm in the uh, Big D Dallas down in Texas. That's right. Okay, so welcome everyone listening. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is Demetrius Gelatis, and I've got Josh Burble with me. And uh, let's see, uh, we're on the Cue It Up Network, so appreciate all you guys listening. So Josh is down in Dallas. Why are you in Dallas, Josh? Uh, Texas Open, Demi. Excellent, excellent. That's I wish I could Aust- be there. With- Go ahead. Yeah, it's in it's in Austin, but I came down to Dallas uh, a few days early to hang out with Telly. Shout out to Telly Shackelford. Thanks for letting me stay at your place. So yeah, excellent. So uh, when did, and the tournament starts this Friday? Yeah, I think it's Thursday, Calcutta, and then Friday start. Yeah, beautiful. And it's a uh, big table ten ball. I know there's quite a sign up list, so I've seen a bunch of the names down there. And it's actually, I know it's actually one of on them. the spot nine ball. Sorry, Dem. Oh, it's on the spot nine ball. Excellent. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. And then uh, I saw. I guess it makes sense. You're not playing a lot of one pocket. I saw there's a one pocket tournament that kicks off too, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is. There is. You're just like you haven't played any one pocket. It's I not just your, haven't. Not what you're focused so. on right now. Exactly. Yeah. That's okay. I. Uh, I. I would. It sounds like fun, man. I'd love to be down there with you. Uh, but yeah, I, I have. Good a gentleman flying in. So actually now is a good time to tell you uh, what I'm, what I'm doing is I've got a boot camp, So I've got a gentleman flying in uh, in here tomorrow night, and then we get together and he is taking a three day boot camp from me. So for anyone left that doesn't know, uh, I am a, uh, an instructor and I do uh, three day boot camps, And that way, a little, little unorthodox, what I do. Um, I don't do lessons where I, you know, for an hour or two, um, I do three days. You, this is a comprehensive one-on-one, like it's, it's a career defining type thing. Like you come here, we put it on your calendar, usually three, four months in advance. Uh, we pick dates that work. You fly up here or drive here. However, you get to Minneapolis, I don't care. Uh, but I pick you up at the airport. You stay with me at my house. And for three days, the entire world stops. And all that matters is getting to know you and your pool game where you are, where you want to be, and exactly where you're at in a bunch of different ways, whether it's physical, mental, goal setting, you know, practice, career management, stroke, stance, fundamentals, or if it's, you know, cue ball patterns, uh, technique, knowledge, you know, and and it could be big things and it could be little things and everything in between. Basically, I evaluate your game from top to bottom figure out where you are, where you want to be. And then I just look at your game from a comprehensive area. And I just start seeing checklists of like where the leaks are. It's kind of like, it's kind of like doing a, a check for like some kind of a, uh, you know, I don't know, breaks or something where you pump a colored gas through it and see where stuff leaks out. Like, I'm just looking at it. Like how good's the safety game? How good's the, you know, the, the kicking game, how good's the jump, how good's the break, how good's the striking, how good's the tip accuracy, where, how good's the understanding of cue ball tools and how those tools are assembled. Where's the mental game at? How do people react to adversity? Like I've just, I'm clocking them in like all these different ways. And then after I see them play for a little bit, hit some balls, I run them through some tests and stuff. And then I'm like, okay, here's, here's how I kind of break down where you're strong and where the, you know, where some things are that we can start working on to, uh, to get them playing at the next level. And then, and then we have three days to to basically set the table of what those things we're going to set our objectives. And then we just go to work on them. So I'm not just giving somebody some pointers and saying, Hey, go get it. Like, Nope. Now we have three days to sit side by side and, and, and just work and get higher and higher level uh, at, at making those things happen so that when they leave, they're playing better than when they came, and they also have a real clear plan of how to continue to, to take their game towards the vision uh, that we that we have, which is them achieving their goals, playing at a high level uh, with a higher higher quality of pool. And it changes everything, man. It changes the physical game. It also changes the you know. It's just for people that have a serious relationship with the game, it's a big deal to to learn how to play this game in a beautiful and enjoyable way. So for anyone that's interested. Please uh, check out my website at mnpoolbootcamp.com, like minnesotapoolbootcamp.com. Uh, otherwise, you can call me 612-747-9210. I'd love to hear from you and uh, get, to know, get to know you, get to know where you're at with your pool game. Maybe I can give you some pointers over the phone, get you going the right way and until uh, things line up to where maybe someday 
you make the trek to my dojo and we get to work. So that's what I'm doing this week. And uh, I'm excited this, this uh, gentleman. Anyway, I'm very excited to work with him and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Yep. It's awesome. It's a side by side, Demi. I mean, that's a big, 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 big part of it. That's, uh, you know, it's priceless. That's why it, it's worth the point. It's a, it's really funny. Yeah. It's, it's, it is a lot of fun. And, uh, that's, you know, it's, I had a gentleman who was actually going to be coming out here in a few months, but, uh, he was wondering if I did online stuff like zoom. And I was like, you know, no, <laughs> I don't. And I'm like, I, I, cause so I had the whole conversation. It's like, you know, I could, I teach through online. I'm like, yeah, I could. And I've done, like, I've done a few things, you know, for a few people online through zoom. And I'm not saying it can't be done. So like, by the way, there's a lot of great instructors that do zoom instruction. And I think that's great. I just, for me, the side by side thing is just, it's different in two ways. One, I can see exactly where they're queuing, where they're striking the cue ball. I can see exactly how much their cue speed is going into the cue ball. I can tell exactly if they got their cue ball fully rolling or if it was still kind of a, a stun run through when they hit the ball. I mean, I know I, I can feel like it's just my understanding of the game is so much more enhanced when I'm side by side with them. And then at the same time, uh, when I'm, you know, if they're struggling or if they're not doing it right, instead of just shouting at a screen, like, no, do this, do that. It's like, I could, show, <laughs> I could just, I could just set it up and shoot the same shot right on their, you know, on the same table right next to them and, and be like, and then it's just, it's just like a picture. See, brains love pictures. They don't like words, you know? And so to sit there and give people a bunch of technical mumbo jumbo about, well, do this and drop that and t- cue here. It's like, here, just do this. And then I just hit the shot and then I have them hit the shot. And it's like, you know, th- now I'm now I'm passionate. Okay, you got me. So there was a there was a part of uh, the inner game of tennis where they talked about two ways to learn to dance. And he, and this guy, uh, the author Tim Galloway, I think is his name. He uh, he was talking about learning to dance in gym class and how the, he learned the foxtrot. And it was like the instructor was like, "You step forward, then you step to the right, then you twist your arm, and then you turn this." And it was like this robotic mechanical instructions. And he said it was like three weeks of daily dancing in gym class before he could even dance without counting in his head and actually could like just do the dance while he could still concentrate on anything else, you know, uh, because for three weeks he was just repeating steps in his head. He said, now you compare that to how like a teenager that goes to a party, they might learn three dances of the same night that are like way more technically complicated than the Foxtrot. And they come home the next morning and and they don't, they've mastered all three dances in like a couple hours or in an hour. And it's like, well, how does that happen? And, and then he went on to make the point that the ironic part is that if you asked him, how do you do those dances? He would say, I don't really know because and he's, I don't know, like this. And he just performed the dance and he would say, I don't know, even though he's completely capable of doing them, but he doesn't know them in, in, in terms of he didn't translate every maneuver into rational analytic understanding so rationally he feels like well i can't i can't analytically describe to you what i'm doing so therefore i guess i don't know whereas the person who did the foxtrot lesson could tell you every step of what was needed to be done and yet might not actually be able to do the dance very well so the person that doesn't do it very well and is clumsy and forced and analytical would say i know how to do it whereas the person that actually can do it really well would say i don't really know how and so anyway the point is is that technical instruction is great But uh, a lot of it is, for me, I like to do the other way of dancing, which is, of course, there's a ton of technical knowledge and understanding that comes. But at the same time, I also understand the value of having somebody next to me where I can just like, hey, listen, I'm a good player. And if I just have you, if I hit a ball, tell you to hit the ball, and then I smooth it out till you're hitting them like me, and then we keep doing that shot after shot, run after run, like, you know, of course, there's a lot of nuance that goes into why we're doing what we're doing and why we're focused on the shots we're focused on. But in the end, people can absorb so much when they're just next to me. It's like, and it's funny because it's like, I could be telling somebody do this or make this adjustment and I'll, and it will struggle for three or four minutes. Then I'll be like, tell you what, let me hit it once. And I'll just get down and shoot it. And then it'll be, Oh, okay. And then they'll shoot it the same way. And I'm like, picture your brain likes pictures. That's it, man. Your brain likes pictures. So for me to sit there in a zoom call and shout at people, it just, it's like, why don't you just come stand next to me and just monkey see, monkey do, soak it all up. And I'll, I'll, it's just like, you're just going to run with me for a few days. And by the end of it, it it'll, <laughs> that's the, I think that's the best way to do it, man. Yes, sir. 
Cool. So, um, okay. So then real quick, uh, I want to give a shout out to Hank the Tank, Harry Lenin, and Kennedy Maiman. Uh, they are two of my, speaking of uh, teaching, uh, imagine that I'd be talking about that. Anyway, two of my students that are uh, going to the youth juniors. So Kennedy, I believe is 15. She, I think she just turned 15. Uh, and then Harry just is 13. And so in any case, they're, uh, they're both here in Minnesota and I've gotten a chance to work with them both, uh, Harry for uh, both for about a year now. And, uh, they're really, uh, it's been awesome. It's been awesome to see him grow. They're both hitting the balls great. And so they are going to represent the USA. Uh, they're not the only ones. So I'm sorry for all, for all of you junior players out there that are, uh, not being shouted out to us. I'm sorry. I, I just, I happen to be coaching these two. I know them very well and, uh, I'm proud of them. So, they're playing some great pool, and they are going to Austria for the Predator 2021 World Junior Nine Ball Championship. And uh, I'll tell you what's going to be tough about that, Josh. They've got the divisions are boys under 17 and girls under 19. So that's a... Uh, In one division, each is not broke down into, like, age groups. Well, no, that's those are the. I mean, so they have boys that's, under nineteen. So a twelve year old could be playing a nineteen year old. Well, no, they have boys under nineteen, boys under seventeen, and girls oh. under nineteen. But yeah, but the boys under so the 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 youngest division is seventeen and under, which means yeah, a twelve year old could be playing a seventeen year old. Yeah, yep. yep, yep. And I mean, these days, playing if you're playing an international junior event, the sixteen and seventeen year olds in that event are probably going to, you know, like they're probably just run me over. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. they're, they're probably playing like world class. Right. Yeah. I mean, what do you think of, like, if you had to guess in a, in a 96 player junior boys event, 17 and under boys, what would you think are like the top three to five Fargo ratings, like of a 17 and under event right now? In the inter- internationally, internationally. Yeah. If you take, yeah. In the U S I would have a different guess, but, I would say in, the, yeah, Asia and stuff. I I would say like mid uh, mid seven hundreds, like high seven hundreds, mid seven hundreds. Are there some players that play at seven sixty, seven seventy in the teens? Yeah, at least I mean, well, Fedor was seventeen when he won the world championship. Oh shoot, yeah, see, uh, yeah, I think I, I I wouldn't say eight. Like there might even be an eight hundred out there, but I, yeah, I, would, I, I was thinking maybe, but I was trying to keep it conservative. Yeah. yeah, I I would think that like I would think that like the top three are probably like. Play. I would think that the top three to five are playing over seven eighty. Um, oh, okay, yeah, well, yeah. I would think that like yep, yep. you know, Ruslan Chinakov and Chris Melling kind of speed, and then it wouldn't yeah. like it wouldn't surprise me if there was a couple that played eight hundred plus. Now I don't know. Anyway, I, could, I don't know all the junior players in the world, and I certainly don't know all of the junior players in Europe or in in, in China uh, or Taiwan. But I, I'll tell you what, you know, uh, I mean, Elijah, I don't know, like from the Philippines, I mean, he played the 10 ball ghost and I think he's pattern racking, but I mean, I'm telling you, he, he broke, he legally, you know, made, he ran 35 out of 36 racks against the 10 ball ghost. So, I mean, he was 16. I, I, I don't know, man. He's like, you've got some good players. Like, I don't know what his Fargo would be, but he he's he's got to be like right there with like Roberto Gomez the way he's hitting him. I mean, he, you know, seven nineties, maybe maybe eight hundred. So yeah. I don't know I, whether or not the top players are eight hundred or seven ninety one. I don't know, but it just seems like, and, and and there might even be there might even be a you know one or two kids that are sixteen seventeen that I don't know about that are that are playing as good as Fedor was. You know what I mean? I, I just yeah. don't know, <laughs> you know? So anyway, yeah. it's going to be tough for a 13 or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, for the 13 year olds, they're going to have the, they're going to have their hands full, but what a great experience, right? Yeah. And I'm excited to see some, uh, some USA players go represent because uh, I know that, you know, Hank, the tank, I know Harry's not, uh, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to be the favorite against everybody in that tournament, considering what we just said. But uh, I also know, that one of the things that's been hurting the U.S. is that our teens are not haven't always been able to compete against international top flight players, and so for them to be able to play really really good players, that's a big big deal for our youth our youth players, and it's also uh, exciting because they're going to have a pro ten uh, pro predator event going on at the same time, so that the kids will be able to play top international junior players 
as well as having a chance to watch some of the best players in the world uh, ringside. Yeah. So yeah, it's a perfect opportunity for for yeah for them to grow and learn and get experience, and that's how they get up higher higher rated. So yeah, yeah, it's very cool. So that's a good good deal. Uh, let's see. Okay, so then uh, we're gonna get to our main topic here in a minute, which is gonna have to do with narratives. But uh, we wanted to tackle a listener question about Fargo rate and bar tables. And so it basically had, the question was basically, if I could paraphrase, do Fargo rates work as well on bar tables? Like, are they as good at predicting outcomes on, you know, is there is there anything lost in translation? Uh, like, for example, Fargo rate doesn't work really well when you're talking one pocket. And do people's Fargo rates, is that is that as accurate for bar table as it is for nine foot? Or is there... Are there some discrepancies? That's kind of the that's kind of the question. So, I'll let you uh, swing first. What uh, what do you think? Like when you well, what do you think? I you know what do you think of Fargo rate overall? Like, are you there's some people that think that it's you know spot on, really accurate, good for the game. There's also people that think it's either wildly inaccurate or it's negative for the game. What, where do you stand on both of those questions? Accuracy I, and, and benefit. Yeah, I think that it is uh, extremely accurate and beneficial. That's what I think. I think, I think there's been nothing even close to it. And uh, other than like known ability or whatever that's and then and local stuff, but as far as nationally, internationally, I mean, maybe some of the, the player rating stuff on, on AccuStats or something, will tell you a person's, you know, what they're capable of, but, but far rates, I think it's an incredible, thing i think it's amazing i think it's i i think it's very accurate and i yeah that's it man and i think it's great for the game i i think it's it's allowed um handicapping events and which adds to more players i we've talked about this before i'm i must i I think down but like obviously i can't i'm not for handicap events i don't play in handicap events i don't whatever, but like for the health and growth and wellness of the sport, like Fargo's awesome, man. So yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. I, I'll, uh, I'll agree with both parts of this. I, I think that uh, it's very accurate. And the funny part, by the way, and I've probably said this before a long time ago, but when people say it's not accurate, um, you know, I mean, we can always look at like anecdotes, right. Where maybe somebody has a small number of games or, you know, that's one anecdote, right? It's, well, this guy was rated that. It's like, yeah, he's got 20 games in the system. That doesn't count. Or somebody will say, well, this guy was that Fargo, and he beat that guy so by, by such and such. But it's like really that his Fargo will change. So Fargo doesn't predict – it doesn't guarantee the outcomes. I mean, if, the, if Fargo guaranteed future outcomes, then we wouldn't play. We would just compare Fargos, and nothing would ever change. So, like, people can, people can outperform and underperform. It just shows, like – averages and you know and 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 really the 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 fargo rate actually comes from past results so in the end fargo is a hundred percent accurate because all fargo is is a reflection of all their past results and so when people say well it's not accurate because that guy's playing better than that it's like well that's like if if that would be like if uh if if i played tyler steyer at a tournament and I, and I beat Tyler 11 to eight. And that would be like somebody saying, well, that's not accurate because he's a better player. He's supposed to beat you 11 to eight. And I'd be like, but that's what happened. <laughs> like that's, I don't yeah, understand. Yeah. What do you mean? Like I'm reporting my score to the tournament director. I won 11 to eight. Like that's what happened. It's like Fargo is just exactly, it's like, that's what happened is that this person has won enough games against the right opponents to get that Fargo. That's just, the score that's exactly it's a, that is a score it's just as real and tangible as an 11 to 8 win it's just a comp it's just a it's an assortment of all their 11 to 8 wins and 11 to 8 losses merged together you know that's all it is and so you can't say it's not accurate it's 100 percent accurate now whether or not it's not going to perfectly predict the future and it doesn't mean that somebody can't perform better than in the future than they did in the past and if they underperformed in the past or if they've grown since then well, then it might go up, you know, but it's like, it is a perfect reflection of what has happened in the past. So anyway, so it's very accurate. And then as far as beneficial, like I, 
I think that the biggest benefit is just having people know where they're at in terms of ability so that they can set goals and get excited about progress. That's it. I think it's exciting to see your number go up. I think it's motivating to want to keep taking strides to make that number go up. And so that's where I think the main benefit comes from. The handicapping, you know, I don't like handicapping. You don't like handicapping. Neither of us play handicapped events. And it's questionable whether handicapped events are beneficial for the overall health of U.S. pool. Um, of course, it draws in players that might not otherwise play. But does it, does it, is it a net positive overall? You know, we could talk about Europe and how they don't really do handicap stuff or as much. Um, I've heard some anecdotal stuff like Filipinos aren't really. Anyway, so the bottom line is like, I'm not sure that handicap pool is, is the best model for us I was pool. Just talking about for volume of people playing but, number of people playing. but yeah but that's yeah the point is overall i think it's beneficial for people to know where they're at and know where they want to get and have up and, and see progress visibly um it's just like a high run and straight pool it's kind of it's just fun you know it's like we've never had that and um i think it's overall it's a good thing so and even if handicaps even if i don't believe in handicaps like handicaps were something i didn't i mean handicaps were around before fargo rate right? so it's not like uh, if anything, it's just making them easier to manage across regions. So, okay. So we're both believers in Fargo. What do you think about the whole bar table thing? How do you think that stacks up? Like, is it, is it the same as big table pool? Uh, it, you know, or is it, is it like one pocket where it's such a different game that the Fargo kind of goes out the window or is it somewhere in between? Like, where do you stand on that? It's weird Dom, because people are playing a ton of bar table player pool throughout the country. And so, like, what what percentage of, of matches do you feel like, if you had to guess, what per, this is a good question, what what percentage of matches that are reported to Fargo annually are bar table versus nine footers? Oh, well, that's a that's a really good one. So, <clears throat> pardon me. I think um, let me try to noodle this out. I'll, I'll come up with a percentage. I'm just going to completely guess. But where it gets tricky is that. 99% of the pool that's played is is amateur, not pro. So the fact that pro events are played primarily on big tables, um, I'm just going to basically throw out all the pro events and say in the sample size of what's coming into Fargo, a lot of that doesn't matter. And then again, maybe maybe not everything's reported to Fargo. So maybe maybe the pro events all report to Fargo. So maybe that actually represents 5 or 10% uh, of the overall input so let's assume that it's like 90 percent amateur so where i live in minnesota all the amateur pools on bar tables but i can't say that same thing across the country i know in texas there's a lot of big table and i know in other parts of the country you know out east you know i mean you don't go to new york and you know it's not bar table it's all nine foot and so and i i I don't know like i i forget you know people tell me When they come train with me, I know a lot of nine foots in Florida. I know a lot of nine foot in California. So there's a lot of parts of the country where they do play primarily nine foot, even at the amateur level. And so, so I would have to say it's probably close to 50, 50, but if, if I had to, if I had to draw the line, it would be close to 50, 50. But if I had to pick, I might say that the bar table might be slightly more than half. Yeah, I would take the over on 50-50 for bar table. I think just because of all the amateur league pool that gets played, and I think a lot of these players that are getting Fargo late start or are playing through the league system, you know? Yeah, but like I said, I mean, I've when we're thinking leagues, we're thinking Wisconsin and Minneapolis, but uh, there's a lot of leagues around the country that play nine foot. So that's where... Oh, really? I got that's, well, Did you hear me? That's what I was just saying. It's like I've got students coming from California, Texas, you know, yeah. all over the place where they play nine foot leagues. Okay. Yeah, so so that's the reason that you know I thought it was close, but you're you might be right. Like even uh, like I know little Chris plays in a league, and even though there's a lot of nine foot stuff going on in Texas, I think his leagues are bar tables. So so if that's yeah, it might be a little higher. Now I actually have, um, and I don't know, I don't know that you know I never know what people want me to say or not say. So I won't mention a name. I'll just say somebody that's very closely involved with Fargo that could probably answer that question exactly will be coming out and doing a boot camp with me in a few weeks. So if anyone's oh. curious, I could probably get that information and come back. And, and anyway, so I'm pretty excited. So, yeah, um, awesome. okay. So, so yeah, so there's a lot of bar table data in Fargo. 
So where were you going with that? You were just, that was your, you threw that question out. <laughs> just, were you just I, buying I, time? Were you just, you just let me out of wild goose chase so you could like stall for time. You were hoping I'd forget exactly. the question. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, well, I told you I didn't want to talk about this in this way, but I can't, I, I got, you got me in a box. I mean, oh, go like, for it, man. What, go for so it. Here's what I'm running. It's our into podcast until we get okay. fired. What's that? It's our podcast until we get fired. <laughs> until we get fired. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm not calling out anybody or saying anything about anything. I'm just saying that my experience is that guys with higher ratings than mine or near ratings. Um, so I'm 710 and I'm, I'm trying to find action, like not big action. I'm not a gambler, like a huge gambler. I'm just trying to find anywhere from like 10 and $20 sets up to two hundred to five hundred dollars sets on special occasions, quote unquote. So I'm I'm looking for action. And what I'm experiencing is over and over and over again is that guys that have their Fargos that I would just assume would would love to play do not want to play on a big table. And that's it. And so, you know, I've and then we have a so we have another mutual acquaintance that that played, you know, high, high level pool and would say things like, I just want to play regional bar table pool because I don't have to practice, you know? So w- when, when people are developing their Fargo on a bar table, but then also I'm talking to professional level players that are saying, I don't even want to play big table pool because I don't want to have to practice and work hard. I, to, to me, something seems weird or like, it's not making sense. Like, it doesn't seem like, like for some, and, and I, you know, like I said, I'm a, I'm a shit eating wild man for Fargo rate. I just, something there just doesn't add up and seems weird. Like, well, should we have a different, should there be a subcategory or different categories for, for uh, bar table versus nine footer. And so with golf, when you talk about handicap, they have a course rating, which has a slope. And so if you're, if you're a four handicap or a five handicap, but a high, you know, like a, an easy course, quote unquote, you, you go to a tougher course and you can get shredded and you can never break 80 kind of thing. So, I don't know what the answer is or what it, what's going on with it or, or, or if there even is an answer, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just, maybe so I, have I, no have, point. I, I have an opinion, but let me, let me just kind of speculate one thing though. It's like, because the players that played bar table pool don't want to play big table. Does that mean that the Fargo isn't right? Or maybe that's just the game that they play. And the same way, could could there, and I'm just asking, could there be a player like, let's say there's a 700 Fargo rate who plays nine foot, could there be a 700 Fargo rate bar table player where the, the, the nine foot player might not do as well playing bar table eight ball against that other guy, you know, and in general, nine foot players can move down to seven foot tables without a problem. But, but I, I mean, we know some specialists that play really, really good bar pool and, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll even go so far as to say I know a few people that have slightly lower Fargo rates than me that might, you know, that might be really tough for me to win against on a bar table. You know what I mean? Just yeah. because the skill – here's – the skill sets are a little different. I mean, the weight of the break is so, so, so critical. And there's there's just different – I mean, I, I could break it down. I just say there's different skills that are required and different skills that are rewarded. And uh, and so so when one person is kind of built for one – track you know and of course there's mostly overlap right most players that play one well can do both well and a lot of players can do both great but but um that doesn't mean that there's not slight differences and so the the players that can play both games well it just means that they've developed skills that go across the board so well that they can kind of like players that can play nine ball and one pocket it's like well they've just developed their skills across the board but of course there are players that just play one pocket better or nine ball better. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, does it, does it necessitate that, that bar? So that, let me ask you. So even if they're different, could it be that, do you think one is lower than the other or do you think they're just different? Yeah, that I think that I just think they're different. That's all them. I just think they're different, you know? Okay. I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, I guess I don't know. Yeah. I think that I will throw out that I do think that I don't, I don't know if they're always lower, but I think in general, I think that people are going to build up their Fargo rate slightly quicker on a bar table. Um, 
just I'm talking slight. Like here's you know, I'm gonna give you some specifics. Okay. And I think that the bar table Fargo rates are a little different because here's what I'm going off of. So as of this recording, Shane just finished playing Dennis, a race to 150 bar table nine ball. And I think he won 150 to 93. Now he played Dennis two races to 120 playing big table nine ball. Tech, you know, he lost them both, but they were both very close, right? 120 to 119. The other one was very close. So like in the end, like he and Dennis playing big table nine ball, you'd have to say they're pretty close. Their Fargo rates are pretty close and their big table nine ball results are very close. And of course we know that there's variance, but for the same guy who lost two sets to Dennis, who plays very, very close to Dennis playing big table nine ball for him to outscore Dennis 150 to 93. That's a, I mean, for that to just be variance, for them to be even playing bar table nine ball and for him to just run 57 games above expected value, like that's, that's a statistical anomaly. I mean, that's, that's almost impossible. And, and so it just goes to show like, okay, they're even on a big table. Their Fargo's are close, but obviously playing on a bar table, things are a little different. Similarly, Skylar Woodward, I don't remember exactly what his difference is with him and Dennis, but they played a hundred race to 150, 10 ball. And, and if Dennis has him by 20 Fargo points, then if Fargo rate represented the same on, on a bar table, Skyler's chance of winning that match would be like, again, it would be almost impossible uh, just because the large, large numbers, this isn't a race to 11, it's a race to 150. And so for Skyler to, to win that set um, again, so then to see the back-to-back matches where Shane wins 150 to 93, Skyler beats Dennis, it doesn't take too long for you to look at these Fargo rates and say, it's not quite, these things are not quite geared for people's actual performances on bar tables all the time. Now, as far as what I've seen, I've also can tell you that for there, I don't know, I'll, I'll tell you, okay, so I'll just tell you an anecdote situation. And I get to work at a hero story. So I played, I played a tournament where I, uh, where Ronnie Elcano showed up at this bar table tournament. And uh, I think it was in Iowa and it was race to eight on both sides. And I played Ronnie Elcano and he, it was one, one. And I made the, the funniest shot I've ever made in my life. Some absolute trick shot of all trick shots on the eight ball to win that game. And it was such a weird thing. Cause then I went on. And caught the caught a gear and ended up winning six in a row. So I beat him eight to one. He came back to the loser side, and on the loser side, I ended up beating him eight to zero, which is it was alternate the break. So the odds of that happening are just completely. I mean, it was just crazy, right? But here's the point: the point is not oh, I'm so great. The point is there's zero chance I would beat Ronnie Alcato eight to one and then eight to zero playing big table nine ball. Like I mean, that would I can't even really fathom that, right? And so. So, but yet when it, when you look at what happened to my Fargo rate at the time, I got sick. I basically outscored him like, a, I think he's a world champion, right? I think I outscored him 16 to one and it counted the same as if I'd done it playing like big table 10 ball or something and in a, in a deep into a pro tournament. So what ended up happening is my Fargo rate hit this high water mark, and, you know, I, 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 you know, it doesn't matter. I just, I didn't think it should be that high. You know what I mean? Like my Fargo rate, like it got to a point where I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's that high. And so, uh, and that's my own personal experience with it. And then as that one aged out and as I've got more nine foot pool tournaments in there where I'm playing good players on a nine foot table and they're holding up a little bit more, um, it seems like it's come back, come back to where I feel like it ought to be. You know what I mean? And it wasn't a huge difference, but it was just like, I just, so anyway, that's my own personal experience with it is like, I just feel like now, of course, he's still going to win more often than he's going to lose. But I feel like the gap, I'll just say this, the gap between me and Ronnie Elcano has got to be a lot smaller on a bar table playing eight ball than it is playing nine, nine ball at a nine foot. Like if I played up a hundred games of bar table, eight ball versus a hundred games of big table, nine ball. And like, if somebody held a gun to my head and said, you know, let's just say I had to win 40 games out of a hundred against Ronnie Elcano. I would pick the bar table. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then, so that's, that's my exact question then, Demi, is my exact thought, which is how can they, how can it all, I, I guess I, uh, there's probably some sort of easy math question that part, but Mike Page would just be like strangling me through the, 
to the the podcast line right now. I may I just don't get it, but it's like how how can it how can it kind of count all the same or work the same? You know, it just doesn't. It, something about it doesn't add up in, in my head. So. Yeah, I I guess that's a it's a fair question, and the only thing I can say is is that is that it far you know like it's the same thing with pool. Like in the end, nothing's perfect. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to get it within a tolerance to where it's good enough. Like what they don't they don't include one pocket within Fargo rate, and they don't include bank pool in Fargo rate, and they yeah. certainly don't include three cushion billiards. Right, they throw that out, and so. So then, so then you got to look at, well, do you, do you count, do you have a separate Fargo rate for nine ball and for, for one pot or for a uh, 10 ball? Like, like they're different games. Like I think anybody in the world, like if, uh, if you looked at say, uh, I don't know, say you take a guy like Billy Thorpe, like maybe Billy Thorpe would play Tyler at nine ball, but I don't think he could win at 10 ball because the break is totally different. And Tyler's got a great 10 ball break and, and he loses some of that when he plays nine ball. Lose, I mean, he breaks great, but he loses some of his edge, you know? Yeah. So it's like, they're different games. And there's an example where I feel like far, I feel like Tyler Steyer's 10 ball Fargo rate might be 20 points higher than it's at, at least. Honestly, it might be even more like he might play Tyler Steyer might play 800 Fargo rate on a playing 10 ball. And he might play, you know, he, or he might play like, it might be like the difference between like seven, 760 versus like, 800 honestly it could be a 40 point difference for tyler because his break when when he plays all those tournaments his break and run percentage he could he could beat the ghost without ball on hand playing 10 ball you know what i mean it's just such a big break and so anyway so the point is like what are you gonna have a separate fargo for like that or you're gonna have a separate what are you gonna have a separate fargo for gold crowns and diamonds and rassins it's like at some point you got to just say well nine ball and ten ball are close enough and Rasmins, uh, Rasmins and Diamonds and, and all this. We're just going to mix the, all the nine foots and all the seven foots rotation games together. And it's not and, perfect, but it's close as close. You know what I mean? Do they do eight ball too in Fargo, by the way? I'm- yes. Yep. Okay. So they do eight ball as well. Okay. Yep. And so, and now I do think, and I, now I can't remember. And I, but I think that the, uh, the gentleman who is uh, coming to train with me, I, I talked to him and he said that he, uh, I think there might be something in the future where they do just what you're saying and they just segregate all the seven foot and nine foot. But I, I, I can't remember for sure if that's what he said. So I, I want to just. Yeah. And just to be clear, it was a question. It wasn't a complaint or anything. No. Yeah. Was, I know. I know. I was, I was just. Like we, hey, or... Well, we were, we were given a question and we're just picking through it. And, um, yeah. and I think our overall consensus is that in general, um, I think that Fargo's earned on a seven foot might be slightly lower than Fargo's earned on a nine foot. Um, but they, it depends. It, they don't, but they don't have to be because if a player who plays like, so there, I would say it this way. It's possible that someone's Fargo rate would be the same on both tables. It's possible that their Fargo rate on a bar table could, could l- give them a little, like a little lift. And the, and that is, and, and I think that the most lift that they can earn would be like the most lift that I could see them earning would be like 10 to 20 Fargo points. If they played a ton of like Bart, like if uh, like I, I think of like Jesse Bowman was like a great bar table player that he played good on a nine footer, but that's not really as where he made his bread and butter. So if like he went around and played like tournaments, like Olathe's Midwest nine ball tour, where he's playing like, you know, some of the best players in the country, like Skylar Woodward and playing, you know, playing top, top flight, you know, competition. Uh, and he's like, doing really well and breaking even with guys that are world-class players on bar tables. Um, he could probably get his Fargo rate a little bit higher than where it would be if he played nine foot. So it's like some people could probably get like a 10 or 20 point lift over where it would be if they played a mix of events or, but in the end, that's a small number of people that it would impact by a small amount. So you, although I think in general, I think, it, I think you could find people that you could point to that have been impacted, but overall, I think it's a very minimal impact for the vast majority of players. So I think it's close enough that, so basically, unless you're actually going to bet a lot of money on Dennis over Skyler, um, I don't really think it matters unless you're actually looking to bet, you know, a big sum of money. I'd say overall, they're pretty close. Okay. Cool. Good question and fun conversation. So, um, yeah, good, good, good. Mm-hmm. All right. So now we're going to try to have a 
feature topic. And this one, you know, it's been a little while since Josh and I did a podcast. I was kind of intimidated by taking this on. So I uh, I just want to dive into it. And uh, I wanted to talk to you. We are going to talk a little bit about narratives, pool narratives. And I was wrestling with the definition. Like, I have no idea, by the way, exactly where this conversation is going to go, which I decided is probably fine. But um, just when we were starting to talk, I was trying to, like, come up with a working definition of what a narrative is. And I'm not sure that I have it boiled down exactly, but the way I was trying to def- define what it, what do I mean when I say narrative or what do you mean? And I think for me, it, it is something, a narrative is a story that we tell ourselves that answers certain questions. And so it's a story that we tell ourselves about who we are, why we play pool, like what is the purpose? What is our goal? Like, what are we doing? What are What are we moving towards? Why is that goal important? And then like, how are we going to get there? And, you know, what, what are, what are the obstacles in our way and how are we going to overcome them? So something, it's a kind of a story that says, here's, here's like, if somebody were to ask me, why do you play pool or what are you going to, how, you know, what are you trying to accomplish and why is that meaningful? If somebody could, and, and I don't even know if everyone could even a- honestly answer what their narrative is, but like if they were in some like truth serum where they were like, you know, or hypnotized to where they somehow were able to answer those questions, it would be like, basically what, and, and, and a lot of it is like, what's that story that's running through their head when they're playing and that's when they're going to their practice table. What is it? That's like, what is, what's the narrative that's driving this ship? So I think in general, it's a story that people tell themselves about who they are and what their relationship is with pool. So what, what do you think of that definition or is there anything I missed or anything you want to change? Cause I'm just, you know, spitball. Oh, I, I, I think that's really good. Dem. I would just add to it maybe or throw, float it out there that it could be that people have a couple narratives or a few narratives that they could kind of float around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what we're going to get into. So, yeah, can we yeah, come up? Can you give I, me an example? Like for I'd people like, that are listening, can you give some examples of like what you might consider to be a narrative? Yeah, you know, this is a this is a silly one, but it's it's kind of uh, it, it's not so silly too. Um, so I have a friend that plays pool, and he's he's a really good pool player. And and I asked him, I said, "Do you think you're lucky at pool or not lucky at pool?" Because I have an opinion on how I feel about luck with pool. Because I feel like growing up, I always felt like I was lucky. Like, you know, I just always felt like good things were going to happen and I was a lucky player. And so it, it, the way it was a, not a major narrative, but it was kind of a sub narrative or a minor narrative that runs through me when I'm playing, which is, you know, if I miss, I, I feel like there's a chance I'm going to hook them or leave them tough or whatever. So good things are going to happen, you know, or if I kick, Good things are going to happen, and uh, and I talked to this guy, and he 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 had the same narrative, like he just kind of felt the same way, you know. And uh, it was just funny because I had felt like I had kind of lost that that narrative, and so I was more negative. And that's where I think it becomes, even though it's not a major narrative, it becomes important, right? Because if if you think bad things are going to happen, you it and you think that. Uh, um, you know, negatively, I mean, you're going to kind of attract that and it's going to be hard on you and you're going to feel less energy while you're playing versus a guy that's like, I'm white magic. I'm lucky. Like good things happen. You know, it's like, you have just kind of a more upbeat attitude about it. So, so that's, that's one example, I think. Yeah. And I could definitely uh, get lost in the talking about that. Cause I think it's so important, you know, cause you have three, you know, I can boil it down to three groups of people, people that believe that, you know, that th- good things, good things happen for them. People that believe that they're like cursed and just things don't work out. And it seems like they run really bad a lot. And then there's people that are like really analytic and just believe, well, luck is just scientific and we all get our share and it just evens out and there's attitude and luck are totally disconnected. So why would we even, you know, and if I, if I count negative roles during a match, I'm just being analytical. I'm not, that's not impacting me because I'm just observing and detached and unemotional about it all where it's like, yeah, but people, and I, and I think that there's, you know, for people that believe that they're unlucky, if they believe that could be part of a narrative where they feel like it's 
it's my job to overcome the the curses of like I've been plagued by the gods, but yet I will triumph because I'm gonna I'm gonna you know outwork the horrible curse that was given to me. You know, so some people that might use that as like a like a, a fuel, like you know, like the joke where pool is a game where I test my skill against other people's luck. And so some people, if they have a narrative that's negative, I would normally assume that that attracts bad things. But maybe some people find a way to find some great glory and purpose in that as for uh believing in positive luck that you have it i think that's great i think that when you're kicking to hit a ball where it's hard to control the kick and you just it's a hard hit to even kick i think that people that believe good things are going to happen are going to be more likely to hit the ball because people that feel like nothing's going to work out and they're hopeless they have less incentive to hit the ball and they're, they're more likely to shrug and air ball it. Cause they're like, well, nothing was going to work anyway. Whereas somebody that's like, man, if I can hit this ball, I bet you something really lucky happens. Then you're like, you're more likely to go all in to hit the ball. And then when you do something lucky might happen and was it lucky? Well, yeah, but it wouldn't have been lucky if you didn't hit it. So, so I think having belief that luck will beat you halfway can help. So anyway, I, I think that's an interesting conversation, but let me ask you this, where, how is that a narrative and not, What's the difference between a narrative versus just a belief? Like that's what if somebody said, well, that's not really a narrative. That's just a belief that I happen to believe in good luck or not. Oh, the, the, where it becomes where it be, well, that's interesting. Well, maybe it is a belief and not a narrative, but I would think that where it becomes a narrative is where it becomes something that it's a repeated story. You tell yourself, you know, um, and maybe you can tell yourself repeatedly beliefs and that that's not a narrative at that point. So I don't know. You might have, you might have got me in a box there, Demi. I was just. Yeah, I don't you... have an I don't have an answer. I almost feel like the narrative is like <laughs> this is so funny because like this is what, it, you know, this is why we didn't rehearse this because this will be fun. I almost feel like beliefs are like the individual transformers. And then like your narrative is kind of like the optimist prime, which is like the sum of all of your beliefs that come together in one monster. Like, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of how I like this, the collection of all like the collection of all your beliefs rolled up into yeah. one story that you tell yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, man. I think that's good. <laughs> like, cool. <laughs> right, and there are more than meets the eye. Let me tell pass you. The, pass the bong. No, <laughs> okay. Just... All right. All right. Good stuff. No, so I'm totally, this is, that's why it's a tough conversation, but fun though. Fun for sure. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, so I'll try to come up with an example of a narrative and, and so, and it's funny. I'm trying to think of how this could, uh, you know, how this could really, some people, some people, okay, and I would think that there's, it's almost like there's certain storylines that people like to reiterate, uh, like, like to act out. So, like, there's one that it's not so much, I see this more in poker than in pool, although it could be in both. So, I want to share this because this is kind of a very good illustration of how there was a book called The Games People Play. And it was written, uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was about interpersonal communication and it was all about like when people are talking and doing things that you know interacting with others there's a subtext and a sub conversation of what's being said so if somebody says one thing they may also be saying i want attention or i want validation or or whatever it is and so so and then there's certain games that people like to play where maybe it's victim pair, pairing up with a rescuer and they could play. They like to play the victim card or somebody else likes to play the rescuer card. And some people like to be indignantly and righteously angry. There's some people that really like to be righteously angry. So they play these games where they put themselves in situations where they're wronged so that they can feel this righteous anger because they get some payoff. Right. They get a payoff for feeling that way where when they feel that way, then they don't have to be you know, introspective about their own problems or they don't have to see themselves in the mirror because they're focused on someone else or i don't know what payoffs they get okay i'm not a psychologist but what i will tell you is one of the stories that stuck out of my mind that i remember from reading that book was the one that goes now i've got you you son of a bitch <laughs> and the way that game is played the way that game is played is where the person would like kind of set a trap or bait the other person and they would they would allow this other person to wrong them and then and then put it in such a way to where they can like 
to make the other person pay for their for their grievances. They could get vengeance against the bully that was, you know, wronging them. And so the way that this I find is interesting is like in poker, if you play poker with good players, those good players play very aggressively. And so if you're not very good at poker or if you're not as good as they are, the way it feels is it feels like you're getting bullied and you feel like a victim. You know, you're playing and you're betting and you're and people are just mowing you down and high rolling you and pushing you out of the pot and making you fold and making you humiliated. And, and you and you're showing that you're weak and you're showing that you're scared and you're showing that you you don't play. You're not as technically skilled and you're and you're just getting like it feels violating and all this stuff. You're just getting mowed down and outclassed and beaten up and losing money publicly. And it's just. It's, you know, it's not much fun. And so what happens is a lot of these poker players that are getting pushed around, they want, they feel like they're getting bullied and they want payback. So a professional poker player, they would just look at it like, you know, okay, what are my decisions to make? What's the right play? They're not getting emotionally drawn into a story. They're just making decisions based on how they're going to play their hand. But lesser aware players that are more amateur, they get very emotional. And they're like, I want to get back that guy. I want to teach him a lesson. I'll show him. And so what they want to do is, without fail, they trap. So maybe they get, maybe they have this fantasy that they're going to get a really, really good hand. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to get a really good hand. And then I'm going to act like the same, like I don't have anything. And I'm going to act like they're, I did before. And then they're going to come in and try to push me around and bet all this money and show me. And they're going to try to bully me around. And I'm just going to act like I did before, like they're going to push me around. But then that time I'm going to have the hand. At that time, I'm going to stand up to them. And I'm going to teach them a lesson, which is you can't bully me around. And if you keep trying to bully me by putting all that money in the pot, one of these days it's going to burn you because I'm going to show you the nuts. And I'm going to flip over my hand. And you're you're going to sit there and you're going to be humbled and humiliated and broken and beaten. I'm going to take all your money and they're going to see that I was right and you were wrong and you were out of line. And yeah. and so it's like this, I got a little carried away, but it's like a big deal. It's a big deal, man, where it's like people really get emotional. And actually one of the things some poker players do is when they push people around like that, uh, they know that anyway, I, I, it doesn't matter about poker strategy, but I, the, the point is that, that the poker players no longer playing the game in terms of making decisions, making positive equity plays, you know what I mean? They're now they're drawn up in a story, which is this guy's a bully. He's out of line. He's pushing me around. I have to take it for now, but wait till I get the goods and I'm going to show them and I'm going to turn the tables and I'm going to make them pay for what they're doing to me. And I'm going to humiliate them the way they've been beating me up. And it turns into like, that's a different story. That's a whole different narrative than somebody who's just trying to make positive value decisions. Right. Yeah. And so when it comes to pool, I see the same thing in, in different, like not the same narrative, but like people play pool and, and there's, I guess that's an example of like telling yourself, like, like you're, you're in a storyline. And, and one that I know is we knew a guy, Josh, that every time he was behind, he would like try to play possum or play dead. Like his whole move was to like, kind of fake surrender <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, where he would be yeah. like, you know, you'd get him down, like you'd be playing really good and you get him down like three to one or four to one. And he'd start acting like he was given up and acting like you'd already won. And it was like this total shark move where he would try to take you out of your game and get you to let up or get you to get sharked or distracted or not try as hard. And he would start like one stroking balls. Like I'm not even trying anymore because it doesn't matter. And so, and so it was almost like this, this narrative where it's like, I'm going to try to like, I'm going to, it's like the tortoise and the hare and I'm the hare and he's the tortoise. So he's going to act like he gave up the race and hope that he can trick me into sleeping under a tree. Cause then as soon as I let up or if I got distracted or, or lost focus, then he would act like he would still act all nonchalant. Like he'd given up as he like cleaned up the three ball run. And then like all of a sudden he'd win a game or two. And then all of a sudden he's like, ha ha, I'm kidding. Now I'm actually trying to win. And like, that was his, that was his move. And I don't really know if that's just sharking or if that's a narrative, but I think I, I felt like with him, this was recurring enough that I would almost say it was almost narrative like in the sense of like, I don't even know if he knew he was doing it. I think it was more just like this narrative where it's like, I know I'm not a threat to anybody. And somehow, and somehow if he just acted like that, 
he had learned subconsciously through reinforcement by other people getting distracted or letting up or getting sharked. He had just kind of subconsciously learned that if he played the role of somebody that had no chance of winning, public, like very loudly and vocally acknowledging that he has no chance of winning, that somehow that kept pressure off him and, and it somehow sharked his opponents. And then uh, I don't know if that quite is what I'm looking for, but anyway, it's like, these are, these are examples of like the roles that people take and the kind of the stories that they, the way that they try to like plot out the script of the movie that they're in. But so anyway, those are just, I've kind of, we're kind of circling around because I think we all know there's a, a couple of really common ones that are prevailing, yeah. but I just wanted to kind of set some tones of like different types of stories that we've seen played out. And and one of the, st- and, and the reason why we're talking about narratives, Demi, I feel like is because we're trying to, I think we're going to circle around to the right thing here, hopefully. And it says that the, the, the lesson in it is, can we identify at least some examples of narratives, not necessarily what we've done so far, but maybe some different ones that are more specific towards pool or, or whatever that people might do, that they could be self-aware and re- understand that they're not necessarily, um, you know, optimal. I mean, that would yeah, be like, yeah, what we really want to do is, right, are there narratives that are more effective at playing well? And are there narratives that are more effective at enjoying yourself and enjoying the journey of pool? That's, I yeah. think, the question. Yep. Yeah. In, in, yeah. So it's like, I don't know how to, how to get there exactly, but like one, like other than just throw narratives, like one narrative that I've been coming across and that, that you've ta- heard, we've talked about a little bit is like the talent versus hard work narrative. And, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, I, I've had multiple people kind of talk. I've had a couple different people that are talking to me and they're talking to me about their talent and their talent and their talent. And, and they're basically, they're, they're talking about how talented they are and, and, and how, well, if they could just kind of put it all together, they have so much talent. And, and I've probably felt that way at times in my life too, and had similar narratives, you know, and, and what it ends up happening in that situation when you focus all on your talent and not on the work that you're willing to put in, because the work that, that you put in is actually what gets you to the results that, that you want. Running into a couple of situations where people are focused on their talent versus focused on the work that they put in. And I just am kind of bombarded by a narrative that says, yeah, but I'm talented. Yeah, but I'm talented. And I'm, and I'm saying, well, it, it really doesn't matter how talented you are. It matters what work you put in. And so if, if you sit and you just rely on this, I'm talented narrative and why is it not happening for me? Because I'm so talented. It should just happen. Or I'm so talented. Someone can just give me a pointer or two and I'll be off to the races. Like it's just, that's not optimal. That's not effective. That's not how you're going to get to where you want to go. Like that's not it. You know, yeah, and I, I, I want to talk about that. Now, I I consider this kind of a belief more than a, a narrative. and Because I, I think that – I we'll get back to narrative in a second, but it's definitely part of the narrative. So I just had this conversation. I swear I have this conversation every three months. And it's like the hot stove, Josh. This is one time where I keep touching the hot stove because I've just – it's such a big deal to me that I, I you know, I, I know what I should do is when people say stuff about talent and they think that top players just have talent that other people don't have, or that you need special talent to be a world-class player. Like when I hear stuff like that, I know what I should do. I should just completely let it go and just remind myself that that is my competition. Like that's, that's my mantra, as you know, like I see people do stuff and believe stuff all the time that I think is totally ineffective. Uh, I just, I just told somebody the other day, like, this is the problem. I watch people play pool. I watch how people talk about pool and how people think about pool. And half the times I want to go and like, it's like watching, I, I sold somebody this. I said, it's like watching when you're at the pool hall and you see somebody at the next table and they're using a claw bridge. They're like a beginner using some claw bridge where their three fingers don't close, but they're kind of like looped around the queue with three claws pointed at the ceiling. And they're like buddy ear bridging almost between their claw. And it's like, you just want to walk over and be like, Hey, just, I don't want to bug you. I know you're not a serious player, but like, just put a fist down and just use a fist bridge. Can you do that for me? Just let's, let's step up from the claw. Can we step up from the claw? And, and, and that's how I, you know, it's just, it's hard to watch somebody miscue every third shot because they're using a claw bridge. And, and when I hear people talking about this stuff, Josh, when I people hear, when I hear people talking about talent, it just like, 
it's like watching somebody miscuing using a claw bridge. It's just, it, it's hard for me not to say anything. And I think that in the future, I'm going to let it go. And, and by the way, the difference is if you wanted to show somebody the claw bridge, there's a difference where some people would, you know, if you wanted to show somebody how to make a bridge, some people would be like, hey, thanks very much. That was cool. Thanks for helping. But then if they looked at you and said, claw bridge is better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Claw bridge yeah. is better. And then they're like willing to draw swords. And like, I, I mean, I, my uncle, you know, he made the end of the break every time he used a claw bridge. And I mean, I, claw bridge is better out. I mean, that, you know, I, you're doing it wrong. It's a claw bridge. Then it's like, okay. Then at that point, you got to let it go. So I will spread, I will be the Johnny Appleseed and you and I can spread the word that hard work is what it's about. But if people want to go to the death and believe in talent and they want to defend talent, like I just have to let it go and remind myself like that's, that's my competition. And that's, that's good. I'm looking forward to playing all, all the talent believers. I look forward to playing them. So anyway, here's the deal. Hard work and talent we all, this is the, the, the summary of the conversation I had most recently is like, we understand that hard work is critical to being a world champion. We also know that talent exists at least as much as you need two arms and two eyes, probably, you know, you need to be able to hold a cue and see the object fall, right? Like we agree that a blind person can't play very good pool. Beyond that, the question is like, well, how much talent is needed? And, and, and we, and, and in the end, it's totally inconclusive, right? Because everybody everybody has anecdotes on both sides. They can tell stories about this one guy that they knew that really wanted it, that played a million hours a day for 20 years and couldn't get good. And then they could also we can also tell anecdotes about people that didn't play very well and aren't technically that great, but they wanted it. They worked so hard for so long that they got there. So there's anecdotes on both sides. So you got to throw all that crap out. And then and then you could sit there and point at all the top players and all the top players had to work hard. But then again, all the talent believers could also say, well, maybe they are also all the recipients of this magical talent. And then you could interview all the top players. And here's the funny part. All the top players would tell you that it's hard work. Okay. They would all tell you it's hard work, but then that doesn't prove that it is hard work because then you could say, well, of course they think it's hard work. They don't realize that they were pri privileged with this magical talent. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but then, although, even if that's the case by, by choosing to believe differently than they do, you're automatically putting yourself in a category that excludes championship level players. But anyway, the point is like going back and forth, this is a, something that nobody's going to be able to win that argument. Like there's not a, there's not a logical or scientific way to conclude that talent is or is not a part of playing high level pool or world class pool. So in the end, it nobody's right or wrong. It has to do it's not about right or wrong. It's about what's useful or not useful. And I am of a firm belief that it is more useful to believe in hard work. One, because that aligns my beliefs with the beliefs of all the other champions in the world. <laughs> so so like right there. Like, I just don't understand. In fact, that by itself should be enough. Like, if you watch everybody else in the world doing something a certain way, that's like all the champions doing something a certain way, for you to sit there and do it a different way, especially if there's no way to prove one way or the other that they're wrong or that you're wrong or that you're right, it's like, that's just being contrary. I mean, that's just being like, I want to... I, it, it doesn't even make any sense to me. There's some weird payoff where they feel like they have to know something or be smarter than other people to where they know something other people don't, or they're viewing things correctly without any evidence. Or it just there's no reason. So right along, right there, just by aligning myself with champions, I feel like I'm one. That's one reason, and that's already enough. But then the other thing is, I believe that the belief in hard work is one that's going to motivate me to put in hard work. Whereas when I start believing that there's this magical talent thing I may or may not have where the hard work I put in may or may not yield results, depending on some something out of my control, like the idea of focusing and allowing things out of my control to influence my behavior negatively, it's just nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. The only argument that I can even make for talent believers is that would you want a 35-year-old father who's working a corporate job and has a family to support? Would you want that person to like quit their job and, and, and risk their, their family's existence and his marriage and his, you know, his house to go try to play pro pool. Cause he thinks he's going to work so hard that he gets it done. It's like, you know, there's always this fear of like delusional, you know, aspirations that are going to lead to disappointment and heartache. And I think that most people that believe in talent, they're really just 
try to stave off disappointment. And then the the only thing you can say is, well, you don't want people to make horrible decisions because they don't understand their limitations. But in the end, I don't see 35 year olds walking away from a career uh, and, and, and losing their kids and family because they're delusional. I just see, but I do see tens of thousands of players limiting themselves with stories that they tell themselves. So in the end, I just like, that's the whole, everything I just said is like, this is the way that whole conversation plays. If that was a game of chess, like that's how white moves, that's how black moves, that's how it plays out. And in the end, scientific logic debate wise, it's got to be a draw. But I just think that you'd have to be an idiot to believe in anything other than hard work for those reasons. So that's where I stand. And, and if everybody disagrees, maybe that may, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I think I believe in talent, you know, like probably more. I like, I'm like, it's almost like it's a double think. You use double think. Double think or a talisman or something. I don't know, like a lucky charm or I just like, I, I do believe in talent. I do believe that people are have gifts. I do believe in giftedness, you know, it's like there's certain things that I, I, that I've seen that I can do eye hand coordination that have nothing to do with any sort of practice training. That's, and then, so I believe that has to be a gift, like a, like a coordination gift. And I think that that comes into my pool game, but then, but then where it gets funny is that like, I keep like pool is an impossibly difficult game for me that I have to just put in so much blunt force work to, to get, to get anywhere with that. It doesn't matter how much talent I have. I, I, I just will get, I'll get nowhere near where I want to get without just absolutely like, just like enormous amounts of hard work so well, and here's what i think is that like i think that that there there is a very there are a lot of dimensions of pool if what we were talking about was um if what we were talking about was a very one one dimensional activity even something like basketball you could talk about like a height advantage and you could say that people that are six foot eight are are advantaged over people that are five foot four OK, and I, and I I think that as a whole, that would be true, right? Like that's so that's a physical born advantage that that's just the way it is. The problem when it comes to pool is that pool is challenging in many, 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 many ways to where hand eye coordination is one thing. And then, you know, there but there's so many things there's. There's how people, you know, visualize. There's how, you know, how people's brains work if they're right brain or left brain centered. There are some people that have tremendous belief in themselves that can be negative if they feel like, you know, they don't have to work that hard because they just believe in themselves. They think their belief's going to carry them. But other people have tremendous confidence. And maybe, maybe it's a birth order thing where they're the oldest child and they just always felt superior to everybody else and not like they were entitled to great success. Or maybe they just, you know, who, who, like, I don't know, maybe they had a lot of success at, at certain things when they were young and they just felt like they were supposed to do this. Or, or maybe they, you know, maybe they grew up in a place where, um, you know, they were always the best player around and they, you know, like, okay, for example, like, I, I know I'm just telling some crazy ideas, but like, suppose there was two really, really, really good players in the same city growing up. And one of them was better. So he always won and he always won and he was always the winner. And he always got it done. And the other guy was a really good player, but couldn't do as well. Okay. And then the, 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 the better of the two players went on and had a great career. And the other guy tried to keep going, but just never had the confidence because he just was always used to like it not working out. Whereas meanwhile, there's another guy from another town who isn't as good as either of them, but always won in his local town. And so maybe the lesser player that always won in his local town ends up beating the guy that's technically better, but is so used to losing. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm, and, and so you've got like, so you've got mental game, physical game, you've got striking, you've got strategy, you've got, you've got work ethic. You've got who grew up in a family that maybe you grew up with a dad who is a professional baseball player and coaches. And, and somehow the stuff that he taught when you know you were a kid just filtered into your consciousness before you even knew what was happening you were programmed for just tremendous amounts of hard work it's like there's so many things that go into being a great pool player that i just to sit there and point at one thing and say like well that game you know that person had some advantages in that one area it's like yeah you need you need to be strong you need to be incredibly strong in a large number of dimensions and you might be you might have a head start in a couple of them, but 
you you are going to have to work really 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 hard to get all of them up to speed and and a couple of them are going to come really really tough and you're going to have to face demons the likes you've never fought before and 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 go to the ends of the earth to make it happen and so the fact that you know the fact that something the fact that not all of it was impossibly difficult doesn't mean that it isn't impossibly difficult and that it's going to be impossibly difficult for everybody and so it's going to come down to who gets it done yeah and just to kind of like throw a little bit extra reason why I think this is important to talk about and why it would affect people that maybe have a talent narrative is like on easy billiards, right? Like this comes up all the time, talent versus hard work, or I've seen it before. And it's like, it always comes out with the, well, you, if you're not six, eight, you can't play in the NBA, you know? And it's like, I'm not, I'm not going to be Michael Jordan. So but what happens is when I hear people saying that, I feel like, and this is coming from a guy that believes in talent. I feel like people don't let, I, I think it's suboptimal to let the, to write it off, to just say, well, I don't have the talent. I'm not, I don't have, I'm not a 17 year old Fedor. So why, why is it even worth trying? You know, it's like the, these people are just talented. Shane's just talented. It's like, no, like what I've, when I hear that, and I feel like, I don't know if that's a belief or a narrative at that point, Demi, I'm a little confused with this all of a sudden, but what I'm saying is when I hear people per- perpetuate those ideas to themselves, all I hear is I quit. I'm not even going to try. And that's, that's where I think it's a, it's a trap or that's where it's, it's needs to be discussed. You know, I, I like think that I can sum it up. I, I can sum that up to say anytime, like there are things you can control and there are things you can't control. And I am just of the belief that like, you have to keep your eyes laser focused only on the things that you can control. And you have to assume that if you, you have to be accountable and you have to act with an underlying belief that if you correctly manage the things you can control, that you can achieve the, any results you want to achieve. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be aware of things you can't control. So if you're aware that some things are challenging, then, or you're aware that there's other things outside of you that you need to like overcome to get where you're going. So in other words, there's things out of my control that I will need to navigate through. Therefore, how do I need to adjust the things I can control to achieve the outcome that I want to achieve? So you have to be aware of the whole world, but in the end, you can only focus. And and it it, it comes to two things. I will only focus my energy on things I can control. And that I believe that if I do that, I can achieve my goals. So what the problem with what you're saying is, is I am focusing on something out of my control and I'm reaching the conclusion that because of these things out of my control, I cannot reach my goals. That conclusion is one that is deeply troubling to me. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just derailing, but you know, it's like, then people are, I don't know. And I think, it, and I think it comes down to if, if, so the problem is if I believe that this thing out of my control is preventing me from reaching my goals, then that allows me to not have to look at my own sphere of control and be accountable and look in the mirror and do the hard work of hitting those goals and doing what I need to do. So as soon as I believe that, that it, it lets me off the hook to where I can say, well, now I just don't have the talent. It's not possible. Therefore, I don't have to try and I don't have to find a way to make it work. And I, and I really, that's it. It's just, it seems like you're just letting yourself off the hook. And, uh, and, and, and at the same time, the cost of the, the good news is, then you don't have to struggle. The struggle's over. The bad news is your life keeps going and you don't reach your goals and you don't get better and and you're not you're not necessarily your best self. So I just think the cost is too high for me. Yeah, agreed. So that's it. I guess I w- so that's where it is. It's like I don't really think it's right or wrong. I just think it's effective or ineffective. And uh, okay, so so that's that's really really cool. Now. In terms of overall narrative, though, I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, I think that is a sub part. Like, like I said, it's like a belief, but I think that as I was thinking about this conversation, Josh, I was going to try to list out a bunch of different narratives, but in the end, I think there's only one that I've really observed uh, that's common. I couldn't come up with a bunch of narratives. Like, there's a couple, but there was only one that I could come up with, which is the narrative that I used to have when I was a teenager. And it's a narrative that I run into a lot. So here seems to be like the general narrative seems to be one of everybody says I can't do it. 
they don't think I could do it. They think they're better than me. I'm going to show them. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to train. And someday they'll all see. And so that's it. Like that's in a nutshell. It's like someday they'll see. And, and that could be, that could be addressed to their own self doubts. Like the part of them that doubts themselves, like, Oh yeah, I'll show you. And they're talking to themselves. It could be addressed towards the public at large. Like, all those people are haters and they don't believe in me and they think they're they think they're better than me and I'll show them or someday they're gonna see that I'm 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 not gobbledygook. I'm the guy that can get it done. And so I just think that that, that overall like like I think that that's an underlying theme of a lot of people is that nobody thinks I can do it. They don't think I have what it takes. I sometimes don't tell myself that, or I sometimes doubt I have what it takes. I'm going to prove it to myself and I'm going to prove it to everybody else that I have what it takes. That seems like a really big underlying narrative. What do, what do you think? I think that that is true. I think that in like competitive hierarchies, I think that that is driving most competitors or a lot of competitors, you know? Yeah. And then the weird part is, I don't have, I don't have all the answers. I mean, there's, there's good and bad with that. Right. So like, there's a lot of good with that, you know, uh, that's very powerful. Like if, if you believe that the world is sorted out into winners and losers and that there's most people are losers, but there's a few special people that are winners and, and that, and that if you don't get the job done, that you're going to end up a loser. But if you can get the job done, then you can be a winner. And it's and it's kind of life defining, heaven or hell. It's it's like like foundationally important to your your value as a person, whether or not you achieve this or not, or and, and prove it. Then then that that creates a powerful incentive, right? Which drives a tremendous a lot of energy. That's a lot of motivation. Um, and so it provides a sense of purpose. It provides a story. It says. It says this, it says life is about being a, a winner and not a loser. And, th- and the way that that's done is through prowess and pool. And so every, you know, so the, the, the purpose of uh, one, one big purpose of my life is to establish that I'm a champion, that I'm a winner. And so I have to do that and whatever has to happen, that's what I have to do. And then if other people doubt me, I'll show them. And if I doubt myself, I'll show myself. And, and, and anytime you know, I wrestle with my own doubts or if I, if I hear other people say snide things about how I'm never going to be a player, then I'm going to just lock that in a bottle. And anytime I need fuel, I'll just replay that message and say, Oh yeah, I, that's why I got to keep practicing is because I got to make them eat their words. Like it, it's a lot of motivation. I mean, it's a, it provides, and it's also, so it provides motivation directly in terms of energy to practice and hours on the table, but it also provides payoffs. You know, when you, when you beat somebody that thought you couldn't do it, or when you show them it, sh- there's some kind of a payoff that you get from like, you know, defeating that, defeating that specter. And I think I would even go so far as to say that, um, that if people are plagued with feelings of insufficiency, okay, then maybe it's almost like they've been bullied their whole life by self doubt. And they can't, they haven't found a way to eliminate the self-doubt. So they just don't feel that way. They haven't found a way to reach like a a total like self-confidence. But what they can do is they could, they could bottle it up and put you, they could force its spirit into that of a tackle dummy and then slay the dummy. So it's like, in other words, each day that they go out, it's like they, it's like the demon of self-doubt lives, but each day they can go out and do something to slay one of its manifestations. So each time they go win a tournament, they slay that demon for the day. And each time they beat somebody they couldn't beat before, they slay that demon for the day. It doesn't it doesn't change it deep down because it, the demon's always there saying that wasn't enough or there's you know, you still haven't proven it or you how come you haven't gotten further. But like but like you get to like run through this cycle of like defeating demon after the demon after demon. And after each demon slaying, even though you didn't kill the underlying cause there's a sense of relief there's a sense of accomplishment there's a sense of um 
reprieve from that demon. And so this is maybe maybe that seems a little far afield, but but I, I would say it provides a ton of motivation. And for people that haven't, for people that are plagued with self doubt or feelings of in, insufficiency, it can provide um, it can provide them a simulation to which they can kind of slay a bunch of dragons that give them temporary feelings of reprieve. What do you think of that? I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was going to say, I was going to say um, temporary feelings because my experience is, um, and no, this is shoot, man, years ago when I was a kid, right? Um, I was competing and playing and it just, I couldn't win enough. I, I could not win enough. I I was playing weekly tournaments. I was winning a ton of tournaments and I would win a lot and I just could never win enough. I couldn't, it was like a, trying to fill a hole that you could never fill, you know? And, and then with, with running that narrative that you were talking about or the, the belief or whatever with, um, you know, I'm going to show you guys cause no one thought I could do it. Right. So and so my wife's talked about Brene Brown as a therapist. My wife's a therapist. We talk about this stuff. So, um, you know, they call it a worthiness hustle. So you're just always hustling to try to prove your worth. And and different people have different worthiness hustles. You know, some people it's competition, um, winning or whatever. Some people are hierarchy. Clients. We all have our own personal El Cuapo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Exactly. That's... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, just like uh, yeah, like three amigos. So, so yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about that worthiness hustle, man. And it's like, so, so anyways, fast forward now, I'm 30 plus years into it. And now I don't, I mean, now that's, that's a, that's a really, that's a sliver of the chart of the pie chart. Now, the reasons why I play in in the bigger part of the pie chart is, you know, personal challenge and trying to, in, 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 in even rabbit hole or dragon eating its tail like part of the 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 thing is the challenge of fighting that challenge you know it's like the, these are the, the the new demons or the new things or the the more kind of so let's, let me come back to where what are because i i want to get into what narrative you know you're you you're beating i want to get to the the what you're doing now as far as uh but but i before we get into what you're doing now and how the old phase into the new i want to keep going on the old just a hair longer so what so, so yeah, but I, I agree with you. It's temporary. Like we're talking about, it's a temporary reprieve. And one of the reasons it's temporary is because it's, it's very, you know, ego driven in the sense that ego means false self identity, which means you have a way of seeing who you are. And, and anyway, one of the strategies that we use is that we always set the bar out of reach for ourselves. And so when, you, when, when we're beating, and I did the same thing as a teenager, I was always looking to prove, 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 prove. And, and so we both, like so many other players, we've all come up with this independently devised strategy that happens to be the same, which is if we are never satisfied and if we always demand more, then we'll get better faster. And then we'll, we're going to get where we want to be. Like our ultimate goal is to be content and fulfilled and happy. And so the fastest way to get there is to always set the bar out of reach so that we're always discontent and unhappy. And that way we're always opt- maximizing our, our motivation so that we're going to get to where we want to be as fast as possible. And so, so by setting the bar out of reach, we'll, we'll always be hungry to get there. And so that's why you and I were never satisfied because, well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Yeah. We're not there yet. We're not world champions yet. it's not good enough yet. And and so for people that haven't really thought about this much, I just want to take the time to sketch that in. The problem with that, okay, the good news about that is it provides motivation in the sense that, like, you're not just sitting around on your on your backside eating Cheetos and saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. So, like, the ego part of you, if you ever challenge that that narrative and say, no, things are okay, I'm going to be okay, it, you know, I could be, I could be, satisfied and proud of what i've done while still striving to do better there's a part of you that'll revolt against that and say no 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 if i if i can live with myself today then that means i won't be motivated and i'll turn out to be worthless and i won't be a champion i'll be a loser and i must be constantly dissatisfied or i won't get there that's the ego defending its strategy um where where the reality is is that if you watch how parents raise kids 
or how managers manage employees or how people train dogs or animals like negative, you know, like if you said that a good manager should per- be perpetually disappointed in their employees and never, ever, ever have any sense of acknowledgement and never let that employee feel like they belong on the team or have a safe position. They're always under fear of being fired and that they're never good enough. Like if you thought that was a good way to manage, clearly that's not right. And if you felt that like, you know, that's a good way to, you know, raise kids like or coach little league, like clearly we would say that's ridiculous. And if you said that, you know, but somehow when people treat themselves that way, they think it's a brilliant strategy. And so I, I just, I don't know that that's optimal because um, it just, if what you're, if, if the underlying issue is that somebody's not like, you know, maybe they've got some self-confidence demons or something. I know what you and I did. So it's like, or some kind of like long time ago, it's like, that's, if we had those demons, then, then building a model in which we're never good enough makes it, makes it kind of worse, not better. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, but it provides a ton of motivation. So where I get confused and where I'm currently confused is like, so we've seen a lot of people beat to this narrative, by the way, like most, like a lot of people, this is kind of a very common narrative. So how has that changed for you, Josh? Like, how would you say that's changed for you? Oh, that's a good question, Dom. And a lot of it's hanging around with you for 15 years, man. So thank you. Um, yeah, I think that now I am aware of my ego problems and my ego driving things you know and that it's never good enough and and uh you know that if i just accomplish this or just accomplish that things will all be better right and um and i've ex- i've accomplished some things so so i realized when i was a kid that it was an empty vat of nothing that was going to turn into anything and I, I could never fill the hole and then and then i quit right and then i came back and i started playing pool again and then I just wanted to never go through that anger again and that, that disappointment and that emptiness. So then I started playing and, and, and it was like many, many years of playing where I just would not push my chips in. I would just be like, yep, it doesn't matter. I'm just, I'm trying, but you know, I'm not really, really, really going to, because I didn't know how to balance it, man. I didn't know how to make it all fit together. You know, how do you flake on and flake off? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you, keep motivated and, and, and strive for something but but without being completely ego driven and, and just you know results focused and so now I'm trying to just play for other reasons you know it's like I and, and, and but then at the same time allow myself a little bit of I gotta have a little bit of aggression in my game I just realized for me I did you know especially yeah, I just did. I, I got to have a little bit of aggression, a little bit of, um, not aggression, but like, it's got to be, you know, I got to ask a little bit more of myself. I got to be, it's got to be okay. I got to raise my bar. I have to, uh, you know, understand that results are important, even though they're not everything, they're important. So it's like that my new thing is just trying to balance it all, man, and trying to be healthy about it. I don't know if that answers the question, Demi, but just it's it's a really it's really cool. So yeah, one the, thing you know. What's that? Kind of flipped the eighty twenty. Like I was probably eighty percent like anger and ego when I was a kid. And then I got older and then I flipped it to, you know, now I'm like I understand that I need then I tried to go where I don't want any ego or any any sort of, of that uh you know results focus or anything. And that that didn't work either. You know, I was kind of zombie walking through tournament after tournament and just punting stacks basically like the same poker and uh now i understand that there's a percentage but it's more like a 20 percent percentage you know and 80 percent is the like the, the journey you know? yeah it's it's a strange one for me and i i certainly don't have it figured out what i a breakthrough experience that i had was when i was 26 or 27 so up until that point I was always in my mind, I was like a young up and comer, you know, like when I was 16, 17, I got playing pretty good when I was 17. Um, And I was like, I thought I was on the fast track to high level pool. Now, I don't care. I don't want to tell a biography. I'll just say 
took some time off pool, try to find a new relationship with the game, but I was a little bit older, you know, just when I, I came back to the game and like 24, I took like four or five years off. And then I came back to the game and I was starting to play again, but I realized I was no longer like I was when I was a kid where I was on some fast track to the top of the world that I thought I was on. Uh, I realized that wasn't the case. And the, and what, what it, I mean, I was playing good. I mean, well, we were friends back then. That was right when we started playing together. I was playing pretty good, but like, uh, this was right around the time that Chia Ching Wu at 16 won the world championship. And he did it with a stunning five rack run. So for those that don't know, he was down 16 to 12 and he came back and ran five racks and out playing nine ball. And so here I am watching a 16 year old run a five back to win a world championship with his opponent on the hill. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, and I was kind of beating myself up. And like, I'm not, I'm like, come on, man. I know I've played more pool than this guy. And I can't sit there and say I'm an up and comer anymore. This kid's 16 and he's winning a world championship. Like what, what's my, what's my malfunction here? And, and I had two breakthrough thoughts and, or maybe they were connected. Maybe they're the same thought, but it basically went like this. You know, if I'm a comparison junkie where I keep comparing myself, comparing myself, comparing myself and beating myself up, comparing myself and beating myself up. Like it used to be that I would compare myself to that guy at the pool hall and beat myself up. Then I would compare myself to the best player in town. Then I would compare myself to this guy. I'm like, if the links that I have to go to to beat myself up, if I have to renew my passport, take an international flight and find out of a one and a half billion person country, find this 16 year old child prodigy on the other side of the globe. And if that is the person I have to go to, to compare myself to, to feel bad about who I am, like I'm, I'm, I guess I'm hitting, I'm pretty good. <laughs> and then, and, and, and I'm not great, but I'm like, but here's the thing. If, if, if I can't, what I realized is I may not be him. I may not be perfect, but I'm like, I've come far enough that, if I can't be satisfied and proud of what I've already achieved right now, that means it's obvious to me that I know if I can't be, if I can't be content with what I've done, then that is proof that I could never, ever be content. It would be like if you were, if you were trying to get rich, right? It would be like if you had $50 billion and you were totally discontent and totally unhappy, it would be like, well, at what point, if you if you had a theory that money would bring you happiness, like if you had fifty dollars, you could be like, no, I, I I just need more. Okay, so now you have fifty thousand dollars. Well, I just need more. Okay, maybe we haven't really tested this theory out all the way. Maybe there is a number. Okay, I have five hundred thousand. That's not enough. I still I just need more. I know I'll be happy. Okay, okay, maybe five hundred thousand isn't enough. When you get the five million, maybe okay. Now it's getting in, you know you're getting a little incredulous, but like once you get to like fifty million or five hundred million, there comes a point at which you get far enough. Do you have enough money accumulated to where you're like, okay, I guess it, if that hasn't made me happy, that I, I guess more money might not be the answer here no, to be to be. being happy. Yeah, and I feel like that was my moment when I when I saw myself comparing myself to Chia Ching Wu at the age of 27. I guess that was my moment when I realized that I had come a long way, and it's not that I didn't want to get better. It's just that I realized that deferring happiness until some future date that I now know will never come might not be the right answer for me. So, okay. So then, so then this brings up a really interesting question, Josh, and this is one that I know you're going to like, do people use the not good enough narrative? And then do they achieve us like, kind of like what I just said, do they achieve a certain level of success to where they have this realization where somewhere, even though it's not good enough, it's it, even though even though their old narrative was it's never good enough, is there a spot that people achieve enough success to where they're like, well, it's never good enough, but that's pretty good. And then they just switch narratives because they've like, do they have to achieve so much? Do they achieve so much that they finally start to become satisfied because they, they realize or or do they achieve so much that they learn that they'll never so okay. I got it now. Do they achieve enough that they're actually satisfied and then become content? Or do they achieve enough to realize that they'll never be satisfied? And so they have to decide to be content with what they have? Or do they never become content? That's the three options. The people that become content, it's either because they've achieved enough to be proud of their success. They've achieved enough to realize 
that they'll never, ever, ever be satisfied unless they make a change in their ways. Or there's people that are just perpetually discontent their whole lives. I feel like for me, I was the one where I didn't achieve all the goals I wanted to hit that I thought would bring me content. I just achieved enough to realize that I was on a road that would never lead to contentment. And that kind of, sh- and that's the experience that changed me. So like, does that make any sense? And which, which happened to you or, or where, which camp are you in? Or did, that, did I say that? Okay. Yes. And I think that my answer is I'm currently swimming in all three camps. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. Demi, is the point. Like I'm okay. Like having problems, like I'm okay with those. Cause, cause, I think I'm a little bit of everything, you know, and I'm trying to balance it all out and, and trying to, you know, defeat the the bad side and, 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 you know, not feed the, the dog, you know, the dog you feed, right. It's like, I'm trying to feed the right dog. And uh, yeah. And I, I think that maybe, maybe there are people, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would hope that everyone that, that has a little bit, of, like, I wouldn't hope that they, everyone has a little bit of everything. I would think that most people have a little bit of everything in them, but it's a weird one josh because where where it gets really strange to me is what if what if being perpetually like i don't know that being perpetually discontent is the greatest like it doesn't feel the greatest in the sense it because it depends on what your strategy is is your strategy to achieve the most fulfilling life uh and to enjoy your time on this planet the best of your ability or is your strategy to get the highest Fargo rating ever. Okay. And I'm not sure. And then it, I'm not sure they're the same answer. And I think that, and then I, they think the weird thing is for people that decide that they can't be happy, then they settle on a high Fargo rate thinking it'll bring them happiness. And so, and so I think that for me, I used to feel that way. I used to feel like I was just going to be kind of unhappy. I was kind of discontent and unfulfilled and had some demons. And I just felt like the best I could do would be to cash in my life for a lot of achievement that would bring me a semblance of content and happiness at times. And, and then I think for me, I switched over some time. I switched more towards where I'm actually kind of pretty good. And I think that that is, I think that being content might not be the optimal strategy in driving a Fargo rate, but it also might, for me, might be a good strategy for enjoying my life and, and, and celebrating my life. And so it's not, and it's not all or nothing because I'm not one camp or the other. And I'm also, it's also not all or nothing because it doesn't mean that I'm perpetually happy and other people are perpetually miserable. So it's, it's very strange, but I think that this is one that I struggle with because, as I said, I teach a couple juniors, right? And and do I want them? Do you know, like, if I if they if they're going to do them, right? They're not going to. They're but I get to influence them to some extent. And if if I had a choice, would I want them to be unhappy and have the highest Fargo rate in the world? And it's like, or would I want them to live good lives and have a healthy balance and healthy relationship with pool. And as we had the Olympics come around and there was all that talk about uh, what's her name withdrawing from the Olympics and, you know, mental health and all these things like this conversation has been circulating. And I've often wondered, you know, our glorification of high level achievement, it makes sense to, uh, to glorify people that do extraordinary things and people that are heroic in many ways. But, but when it comes to being, at the very, very, very tippy top of one very specific hierarchy to where they've been completely miserable and out of balance in their life in many, many ways. And I'm not saying that Phil or Fedor are like that. I'm just saying in general, like they're, you know, when people are doing, you know, taking steroids to bike or cycle up in mountains or, you know, like at some point, you know, or, or training 16 hours as a ballerina, like there comes a point where like I admire success to a large degree until it skews so much. It's like going from quantum physics to metaphysics or whatever, where it's like all the rules of the existence change. And it starts going from being inspirational to being kind of tragic to me. And I don't know, man, I don't know what I want for these junior players. So I'm glad they don't ask me. They just ask me how to play pool and I get to tell them and try to help them on their way. But, but like, are they the same, you know, and which like, are, are they the same? Is, is high Fargo rate the same as content and, and, and do people go for Fargo because they can't get content and which would they rather have? It's, I don't have, I'm not even asking. It's just confusing, right? It's confusing. Yeah. I, I think, 
Um, well, so my position would be, I don't push anything on my kids. Like I pushed myself very hard as a youth player with pool. And, and I remember being 11 years old and bowling till my thumb bled. Like I bowled like 15 games in a day. And I just, that was the way I was wired. I don't know. It just somehow with the way I was raised with my dad or whatever, who knows, but, but like, I don't push anything on my kids like that. I let them sort of see what they want to do. And if, so if my kids aren't junior players that are going to the worlds, no big deal. I'm awesome. It's congratulations to the kids that are going and it's great. I'm just saying if my kids were playing pool, I would just have a conversation with them. Like you're saying, like you're talking about, like, so I can only speak for my own kids and not someone else's kids unless, but I don't know. It's different because you're training them. So there's, there's more of a connection there, but I think letting them know that, that, here's the here are the traps here are the pitfalls and here are some of the things that you can get caught up in and just making them aware of it because that's what I'm trying to do for myself is just be aware of these pitfalls and traps now and understand that I'm not perfect and I can fall into them but part of the joy of pool for me and the journey of pool for me is fighting those pitfalls and traps and and uh you know that's not the whole journey, but that's part of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that if I were to sum up, I'm going to tie in what you just said, because I think if I were to sum up like my narrative today, it went from like, I'm going to prove it to myself or prove it to everybody else. And someday they'll see it. I'll show them and all this stuff. It, now my narrative is more, I believe that life should be enjoyed and celebrated. And that one of the, important ways that we celebrate and show appreciation for the life, the gifts and the time that we've been given is using them to the best of our ability. I think there's something higher quality about living in a way that, that has that, that to where we can say, you know, like you pass that test each day where did I, did I give my best today? Is this, you know, when I look back at the road I walked, am I proud of it or am I ashamed of it? Was it, was it, did I do something good with it or did I fritter it away? And I, and I feel like somewhere deep down pool's important to me for a couple reasons. One, I think directly, I think that it's a, it's an amazing game and that when we, and we, when we play it well and, and, take, and if we're going to do it, like for people that want to quit pool, I'm totally fine if they don't play. But for people that are going to spend their life, for people that are going to spend a big amount of their life playing this game, it seems like you should play it to the best of your ability. And that that's higher quality than knocking balls around and not, not trying. And so, so there seems to be an underlying purpose in playing well. And not only that, I think there's also things that when you play pool well, it forces you to, to be accountable and grow and change and, and you learn a language of how to succeed. In order to play good pool, you have to learn good attitudes. You have to learn good work ethic. You have to learn, you know, a right mindset. And you have to be very accountable. And you have to be very goal-driven. And so so there's things that you actually, by becoming a good pool player, you actually grow into a, a person that is becomes a good living person. Like you, 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 I mean, I became successful in other things in my life because what I've done in pool made everything else seem fairly easy. And so I feel like it, it not only, I feel like it's important to do your best in life and make the most out of yourself. And so if you're going to play pool it applies to pool, and then what you learn from pool can help you make the most of yourself in other ways in life too. So I feel like it's there. It's very, very, very profound for me. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a meaningful game at the same time. It's also a a, a working model of of uh, like a simulation of how to adapt yourself to be somebody that makes your time count. And so that's that's kind of been why I still feel that pool is very important, even though um, even though I've achieved. A, a higher level of content and fulfillment where I don't feel like I need a higher Fargo rate to feel happier. Like I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to feel any different with a higher Fargo rate, but I feel like sitting around and saying, well, I don't need to work then because I'm good. That's not a high quality decision. That doesn't seem like the road that, that I need to be on. So I feel, I feel a sense of purpose and continuing to push as hard as I can push. 
And then the other sense of purpose is, is that if I allow people that are very, very destructive and negative and cancerous or, or hate filled and rage filled, if I allow those people to have a motivation edge on me, then I kind of feel like I'm letting the dark side of the force win. I'm letting the terrorists win. And I feel like it's my job to show that you can play this game without being in a negative hell and still and play it from a sense of love and beauty and, and celebration and still play well. And, and then, and, and I think the reason I believe that's possible to some extent is because like, if you're a rock climber and you get out on a rock, if you're in a life and death situation, you're not ego driven to like, I'm going to climb this climb and take a selfie at the top and prove to everybody I can climb. Like there's another motivation is you don't want to fall. And what I would say, Josh, is that when I compete, I'm not thinking about Fargo rate. And I'm not thinking about how I want to tell everybody I beat this guy. When I compete, I just flat out forget that it's not life and death because I just something about it, man, something about a pool match. Once you flip that coin, I just, it's like, I, it's like, double thing like i just forget that this is not life and death and i feel like i'm in a survival situation and uh and so i feel very 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 motivated when i compete uh even though it's not a worth related motivation if that makes sense now does that carry through to where i'm practicing eight hours a day on my own it doesn't and so i have to figure some things out i got to figure out do i need more competition to create more of that motivation do i need do I need to just, do I need to find a little bit more mix and, you know, turn the hot faucet on and, 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 and start getting a little bit more ego driven or do I, or am I a content, you know, not optimizing my Fargo rate mission because I don't want to trade it off or is there something I'm missing or am I doing okay? And it's like, I think overall I'm satisfied with where I am today, but I want to get better at pool and I'm satisfied with where I am today, but I also want to continue to find better ways to balance that myself and so kind of the same thing as you it's like trying to work through it but we're working through it and i'm working through it you're working through it and we're both happy with where we've come and we're both trying to get better you know yeah oh i'm i lost you again yeah okay so that's what I would say my narrative today is. So what, I mean, what about you? Like if you had to if define your narrative today, you said you had a little of each of those roads, but like just, I, I wanted to give you, if you wanted to take a little time to share to the listeners, like what would be the story that you beat? Like, why is it important to you to, to get better at pool? Yeah, I think I'm just trying to figure it out, man. Like I'm trying to figure it out. Like I, I quit pool. Um, two and a half years ago, I think, three years ago, I quit for about a year because I just couldn't figure it out. I, I couldn't find peace. I couldn't find any joy in the game. Like, like I was just frustrated, right? And then I, and then I came back to it about two years ago because I just missed it, man. I just missed the competition. I just missed having to train and practice and and all these things and so for me pool force it, it doesn't force me it just it gives me purpose for other training in my life like I get up and run early in the mornings I lift weights I do stuff I try to watch what I eat it's just it, it just makes me a better person so my thing with pool is I believe that when I'm playing pool makes me a better person like I have to be a better person to be a good pool player I have to fight my ego to be a good pool player to be the best I can be or to, to break through these challenges you know like I'm I've said before I'm I'm like socially I uh anxious I don't like playing in front of people so like I to to face that demon is very very challenging to, to me and, and the, so the process for me pool is more a process of facing my fears. And, and so that's meaningful to me. And so facing my fears doesn't seem like it's just, like it's an ego driven thing, you know, like a whole filling thing or a, or a, a worthiness hustle thing. It seems like it's a, it's to me, it has some significance or it has, I'm, I like that idea, you know, um, so that's kind of what I'm doing with pool is I'm facing my fears and 
now I do have a percentage of show those peeps and punks, right? I just like, uh, like, like Fast Eddie, I do have a percentage of that. It's a smaller percentage, but it's a percentage because when I also, when I came back to pool a couple of years ago, I realized I needed a little bit of edge. I, I just was not, I did not have any edge in, on me. And when it went for me in order to, to, to continue to pocket balls and to continue to, to stay focused and to concentrate, I got to have a tiny little edge somewhere in there or in order to go out in the garage and practice for hours and hours, I need a little bit of an edge. I need a little bit of something. Why am I doing this? You know? So, so I'm just like, that's, that's my, that's my process now is just trying to limit and manage the things that aren't quote unquote as healthy and trying to encourage the things and focus on the things that are healthy and try to be a healthy person and try to, be constantly growing and challenging myself a little bit every day. So that's, yeah. That's and I find it, I find it fascinating. I mean, I really am, uh, I'm really interested because, and I, I'm, I'm good on the conversation because I'm very curious to see if the listeners will email me, uh, or email us. I'm at, I'm at info at mnpoolbootcamp.com. And so I'm very curious, like basically I wonder if there's a, bubbling source of motivation that can that can come from a place other than this isn't good enough it needs to get better so i can prove it to everybody or myself like that that seems to be like most of my life that was like always the big lever to pull right and so right now when you say you need a mix of that like i don't blame you like i um i get it like i just feel like if we took all of that out is the is the absence of that then we're just going to sit around and turn into couch potatoes and never never hit a ball again and just go to rot like is that the only is that the only outcome if we remove that like there's no part of us that can say i want to play and work hard on pool and perform well because it just that's how i want to celebrate my gifts and be you know that seems higher quality and more enjoyable than stagnating and and watching myself you know quit playing or or play mediocre and and, and just kind of piss everything away like it just seems like it just and i'm not saying you're doing it wrong that you that you need any kind of mix and i'm i'm pushing myself too because i i know josh that if i turned up the other faucet that i could push harder you know what i mean i know i could but i'm just i'm searching i just i feel like i feel like if i go back and turn on that faucet for me that it's just like well that that's going to end like then i'll just do it that way so it's like i'm, I'm searching to find other ways of channeling motivation and what i just described to you it's not it's not motivating me like i was when i was 13 but it's still motivating me to where i practice and compete you know what i mean so it's like uh but then i don't know that anything would motivate me the way i was when i was 13 so that i'm comparing apples and oranges so it's it's i don't know man i'm I'm totally confused but i i think we're both trying to find ways of being healthy enjoy our game and still you know try to be better tomorrow than we are today both with our actual play and with our narratives I hope everyone got something out of it, and I, I hope to hear from some of you. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, – oh, uh, we had the road stories, but this has been a lot. We'll, we'll save the road stories for next time. All right, Josh, I'll catch you next time. <laughs>